Hello, welcome to this live stream. I'm really excited about this one. It is about how to play any stringed instrument. Uh, so not just the guitar. So a lot of times we talk about the guitar here, but you can expand your palette as a songwriter so much using the patterns of music theory. And we're gonna see how that's done to really tackle eight instruments in total. So let me know where you're coming from on this live. Uh, and if you're part of the replay crew, as always, let me know where you're at because I'm always interested to hear and see where people are in the world. So uh, stringed instruments. It seems like sometimes, you know, there are musicians who are savants where they can just play multiple instruments and it's just like, wow, they just pick up an instrument and they can start to play and it's amazing. So for example, George Harrison of the Beatles was their guitar player. Uh, but he played more than just the guitar. Sometimes he would play bass, uh, rarely in songs. Hey, Rusty, Rodney, it's cool to see you on. Um, so George Harrison was amazing on guitar, of course, also played bass, uh, and also was an avid ukulele fan, if you didn't know, like, especially after the Beatles and later in life, he would uh, have friends over, hand out a bunch of ukuleles, and the friends would play ukulele in a circle and just have jams on the uke. Of course, he played sitar and all sorts of instruments. Now we're going to focus on stringed instruments based on the Western uh, musical scales. So not the sitar in this example, but we are going to look at eight instruments and see how George Harrison did it, how all sorts of musicians do it, how they expand their palette, their instrument palette, using the patterns of music theory. And it's actually not as complicated as it might look. So, hey, PCAST, Jonathan and Daryl, cool to see you on. Um, this is going to be a fun one. Uh, it's actually, it kind of blows my mind how simple it can be to learn any instrument. So, it's not that these musicians, these multi-instrumentalists are savants. They're just observant. Uh, it's almost a rhyme, but <laughs> it's just that they got, they wrapped their head around the patterns of music. So um, let us look at what we're talking about here because it's really cool. And first, just want to show this picture of George Harrison. So, you know, I'm telling the truth. This is him uh, looking very thoughtful off to the side, <laughs> holding his uke, strumming a chord. And, and we're going to look also at why the ukulele and guitar in particular are especially well suited to playing chords, why those are instruments of harmony and why other instruments are not so much. It'll all make sense by the end of this. So uh, let's get into the eight instruments that we're going to look at, which are the guitar. Uh, whoop. We're gonna look at the guitar, the bass guitar, the double bass or the stand-up bass, uh, like the bass player for Elvis played this style. This was more the style before um, other pop musicians made the bass, electric bass, more popular. Um, the ukulele, mandolin, violin, viola, and cello. These are actually all just permutations of the same fundamental patterns, uh, and that's how musicians do it. That's how they learn these instruments and pick them up so quickly. So uh, let's look at... Well, and... and, and one thing to keep in mind with these instruments is it's very tempting to look at the bodies of these instruments, the craftsmanship, like the actual like design of the instruments is what a lot of people focus on. You know, you have these like F holes on, you know, stringed instruments like the cello, viola, violin, even this band, uh, mandolin has some of those holes. You know, the, the guitar has this open sound hole. Ukulele kind of looks similar. The double bass, of course, has those F holes as well. Um, the electric bass, you know, it has different pickups and the wood types. And, you know, there are a lot of videos and, and um, you know, fans of the craftsmanship. Luthiers, you know, have years and years of experience in crafting these amazing instruments. But what really is... What matters, what we're going to focus on is the actual theory on the fingerboards or in the case of like the guitar, the bass, the ukulele, fretboards, um, or if they don't have frets, just fingerboards. But what really matters is that part of the instrument 
the underlying patterns, the note patterns that are informing how you play different notes, scales, and in the case of some of the instruments, chords and progressions. So uh, let's get at, I'm just referring to my notes here. Um, the most popular instrument out of all of these is the guitar. So uh, you have Woody Guthrie here who definitely popularized the guitar among folk guitarists. He has this little sign here that says, this machine kills fascists. <laughs> and then Donovan, if you know Donovan Leach, uh, and, and also um, Bob Dylan uh, had this same sign on the back of his guitar. Donovan, as an homage to Woody Guthrie, has this machine kills. In that sense, he didn't say fascists, but his this machine kills, he said he meant negativity. And then, you know, of course, Bob Dylan was a fan and uh, played the guitar as well. And really what the guitar is, is it is it can kill, but it also is a chord playing machine. It's a machine that can play chords. It's a it's a machine of harmony. And so in uh, other videos, I talk about how this how this pattern, how the uh, fretboard, the notes on the fretboard of a guitar are laid out. And we'll look at that at a high level here, but I have some videos about the fretboard map and also the mathematics, the mind blowing mathematics of music or the guitar that talk about in essence, how this pattern is formed. But in a nutshell, what it is, is it, the fretboard is the intersection of the circle of fifths. So this is the circle of fifths and cascading down each fret, the notes, move in a pattern of fifths and then along each string the notes rise up the fretboard in a chromatic scale pattern and so it's this intersection uh, between the circle of fifths and the chromatic scale that is in essence what the fretboard is the guitar fretboard is is this matrix of notes and uh, i'm just focusing on this this pattern for example where it's you know b flat f c g a and so on. It's a circle of fifths pattern. Circle of fifths meaning moving down, or it's a circle of fourths moving up. A to D to G to C to F to B flat, and so on. So this is just one fret or one vertical column with this shift. We'll look at the shift here in a second. Or you all, it also works like if we were to focus on this pattern, it's, it's still the same thing. Circle of fourths, moving up, circle of fifths, moving down along any fret. And so because music is cyclical and symmetrical, these same patterns, no matter what vertical, you know, Y axis, as it were, you're looking at, that's the circle of fifths or slash circle of fourths. And then any horizontal X axis or string is a chromatic scale. So the low E string is a chromatic scale. The A string is a chromatic scale, D string, G string, B and E and so on. Now, I'll get comments sometimes from people who say, hey, wait a sec, though, that pattern breaks. I hear the word breaks a lot <laughs> when, when they say that there's this shift between these, these two strings. Notice how there's kind of this crook in that vertical uh, line up each fret um, because instead of you know, the sixth string is, you know, you go up to a fourth to the fifth string, up to a fourth to the fourth string, up a fourth, and then up a major third right here. And this shift um, accounts for this, this crook in the Y axis. And people say, oh, the pattern breaks. Well, it doesn't break, it shifts. <laughs> so there's nothing broken here. And actually, it's really cool how it works out that this shift that seems crooked, it is literally crooked, is actually an amazing design feature of the guitar and allows for, in essence, in a nutshell, it just makes for better ergonomics. Uh, for the way that the human finger and then the joints are positioned, it allows you to play these, uh, these chords because major thirds uh, are in major chords and minor thirds are in minor chords and all the derivation chords from those. And so this shift is actually a beautiful feature. It's not a broken element. And so whenever I hear people say, oh, it's broken, 
I'm just like, your myopia is showing. Like, it's actually a beautiful thing. So we'll actually see how this shift also shows up in another of the eight instruments that we're going to look at and why it's so beneficial to playing chords in particular. Now, again, the guitar is so popular that it is going to be kind of our starting point um, and our reference point for all of the other eight instruments that we're going to look at. Uh, so keeping this pattern in mind, uh, we have, you know, E, whoop, we have a low E, then A, D, G, B, E. If you've ever tuned a guitar, you know, uh, the standard tuning, that is the tuning. And when we say it's open strings, this is like the nut of the guitar. So this is where you press your fingers on these frets. The fret numbers are right there. And then the nut or the open strings, this says open, are right here. So you tune the low E uh, string to E, tune this to A, to D, to G, to B, and E. And so that is what makes for this, you know, circle of fourths or circle of fifths pattern based on the standard tuning of the guitar. Like, like I say, we're going to look at other instruments that are derivations or derived from this really beautiful pattern. Uh, and again, this is a matrix of circle of fifths slash fourths vertically and uh, chromatic scales horizontally. It's, it's a really cool pattern. So let's look at, we're going to look at eight instruments. Uh, like I say, it's uh, the ukulele, guitar, bass guitar, double bass, mandolin, violin, viola, and cello. And we're going to look at each one in turn, but um, you're going to see there are some really awesome connections between these instruments that makes it easy, like I say, to jump from one to the next. Being a multi-instrumentalist is not magic. It's, it's like almost stupid easy <laughs> how it works out. So let's look at it. Um, now, it, it can be kind of overwhelming to look at uh, each instrument as, as a matrix. So, you know, like we say with the guitar, it is again, a circle of fifth slash fourths vertically and a chromatic scale horizontally. The same basic idea applies to all of these instruments. And so instead of looking at the instrument as a whole, like all of the frets uh, moving up each instrument or all of the finger positions, let's just chop off the whole fretboard and just look at the tuning because this tuning is going to basically inform how all of the other notes are aligned. So if we focus on just the tuning of each respective instrument and compare those, we like cut to the chase as far as what, what, we're, what the pattern is on each fingerboard. So what I mean by that is looking at this synopsis, these are the open strings or how the strings are tuned on each, each instrument. So uh, starting with one that is familiar that we know, we have E, A, D, G, B, and E. It's the guitar. Those are the open strings or the strings that you, you know, the tuning for the standard tuning on a guitar. The bass guitar is basically just the bottom four strings of the six string guitar um, we just lopped off the top two strings. So there's not that shift uh, between the second and third strings. And we just have on the bass guitar, the bottom four strings, but it's the same pattern. Now it's an octave lower because it's bass. Bass just means lower, um, but it's, it's the same pattern. So that's why, you know, for example, Paul McCartney, was just you know amazing on the bass and he could just play the guitar and like if he, he if he wrote a chord progression on the guitar he could come up with a really cool bass line because he didn't have to relearn things he was just basically doing a bass line based on the chord progression and following the sequence that he had composed on the guitar itself the double bass is or the stand up bass is the same tuning as well so, and it's double bass, so it's down another octave. So it's even lower. But if you were to, you know, like, like I say, I can't remember his name, but the bass player for Elvis, like, you know, when they're playing Hound Dog, you know, he's 
he's strumming this bass, which actually I think Paul McCartney later bought that actual bass and owns that stand-up bass that was used. But um, same pattern. So that's why, you know, you can see musicians sometimes in, in videos or just you know, in recordings or playing the double bass. Well, again, they didn't have to go back to the drawing board and learn a new pattern. It's just based on the bass guitar pattern, which is itself based on the guitar pattern. So it's like you're killing three birds with one stone, uh, the guitar, the bass guitar and the double bass, just understanding that it is uh, tuned to this vertical uh, tuning of the circle of fifths slash circle of fourths, depending on if you're going up or down. Now, the ukulele, we're going to come back to this one, but the ukulele is actually, uh, instead of chopping off the top two strings like the bass guitar does from the guitar, we're chopping off the bottom two strings and playing the top four strings, but up a fourth. So the ukulele is actually just a subset of the guitar. And uh, that's why, you know, George Harrison can just pick up a ukulele and play it because he's he understands the guitar. So it's really just smaller chords on the ukulele. We'll look at that in more detail. And then the mandolin, violin, viola, and cello uh, have some cool things going on. Uh, so we'll look into that in more detail. So let's look at the ba uh, well, the guitar. So again, we have the guitar, standard tuning. I'm going to kind of keep coming back to the guitar because it's our it's our frame of reference. It's our starting point uh, tuned to E, A, D, G, B, and E. Now, <clears throat> the guitar is beautiful and super informative. And once you understand the guitar or reversing it, if you start it on the violin, for example, and you're like, damn, I really want to play the guitar or vice versa. If you want to play the, if you play the guitar and you're like, I'd really like to expand into maybe the cello. Well, they all, there's like passageways. There's musical theory passageways that allow you to pick up an instrument really quickly. Uh, and <clears throat> in the library have uh, different diagrams. I've posted some of the diagrams and I'm going to be adding more uh, to dozens of different instruments, uh, including the glockenspiel or the, you know, the keyboard or, you know, the trombone, like all sorts of instruments. But we're focusing on stringed instruments because it's so visually easy to see their relationships here. So the bass guitar, like I say, is just the guitar uh, minus the top two strings. So we've got E, A, D, and G. And so the same principles apply. You've got the circle of fifth slash fourth vertically and the chromatic scale on each string horizontally. It's this matrix, this interlaced matrix of notes. Now, in other videos, I get into more detail and other posts in the library. I get into more detail about how how this matrix, it's one thing to say it's a matrix or this, this uh, interlaced pattern of circle of fists and, and uh, chromatic scale. It's another thing to see how that applies to playing scales and modes and chords. And so I'm not getting into that, the, that level of detail here, but knowing that these two fundamental patterns in music, the circle of fifths and the chromatic scale are interlaced and both patterns are inherently cyclical and symmetrical, uh, that uh, this interlaced matrix allows you to play, uh, you know, all of those patterns on a guitar. In the case of a bass though, you're not really playing chords so much. You're playing more like melodic bass lines or, you know, uh, following the root progression of, of a chord sequence, uh, but you're able to do it and, and basically play the same fret and note uh, string positions because, again, it's the same pattern. <laughs> um, I'm kind of beating a dead horse there, but it is fundamental to how you jump, say, from the guitar to the bass guitar. Likewise, if you wanted to play the double bass, there ain't no learning, relearning going on. It is the same thing. It's E, A, D, and G. Now, instead of holding it, you know, with a strap on your shoulder and playing the fretboard horizontally, the double bass, I'm showing it on its side because that's, in essence, the perspective we're looking at here, just like on the bass. This is a lot of people say, why is that backwards? I, I'm orienting it to how most right handed players look, which is holding it. If you were to hold the guitar up or in this case, the bass guitar and look at it from your playing perspective, that's how it looks. This is how the fretboard looks. 
And this is a diagram, a simplified diagram of that same pattern. So double base is the same thing. I have it on its side to show, you know, that orientation as it relates to the fretboard diagram, but you actually play the double base standing up where this part is on the ground. This is the ground and this is the person standing <laughs> next to it. How's that for some nice art? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'd have to make that. Uh, I'd have to redraw that to, to look better. But anyway, so in summary, what we're looking at is if we look at at least a summary up to this point, if we look at the guitar, we have the guitar here, and then we have the double bass and the bass guitar are the bottom four strings. So strings six, five, four, and three right here. So this black boundary highlights the bass and the double bass, which are a subset of the guitar. And then the ukulele, we haven't looked at the ukulele yet, but the ukulele is just starts on string, uh, fret five and it's this white boundary and it is the top four strings. So it includes this shift between strings two and three that, like I say, ergonomically makes it easier to play chords. So when people say, oh, you know, on a guitar, this pattern, when there's a shift between the um, strings uh, two and three, they say that it's a broken pattern. It's not broken to the point that the ukulele actually leverages the fact that um, there's this shift to make it easier to play chords. Because if you think of the eight instruments we're looking at, the guitar, the bass, the double bass, the ukulele, the mandolin, the violin, the viola, and the cello, what are the two, what are the two instruments that are most, mostly played, the most popular chord playing instruments? They are the guitar and the ukulele. And it's not a coincidence that those two instruments, the guitar and the ukulele, happen to have that shift between strings that, that shifts up uh, the notes so that there's a, a major third separating two of the notes. Because tertian intervals are, tertian meaning intervals of thirds, either major or minor thirds, are used in chords. And chords are what you play on guitar and ukulele. So again, that shift is not a break. It is a feature. It's not, it's not a bug. It's a feature <laughs> of the guitar fretboard, the ukulele, and you're going to see how that comes into the other instruments here. So let's look at this a little bit more uh, with the ukulele. So again, we have this shift here that allows you to play, for example, C, E, and G. Like on a guitar, um, you can play, let me go back up to the guitar. You can play C, E, and G right here on uh, the, uh, the fifth fret. Otherwise, you'd have to, if the shift, if you're playing uh, down here, you have C, E, and G. That now you have to shift the other direction with your fingers uh, to make up for the fact that there isn't a shift between the strings right there. Um, now, that works out uh, based on how you play, say, like an open C, C, E, G, like that, um, and you, you don't bar there's no barred finger right there because you're just using two fingers to like play those two uh, notes, but you can play a barred chord up here because all of those notes are on the same fret. And it's due to this shift between strings. Um, and this same shift, we take advantage of this, the shift that happens within those four strings on the ukulele uh, and why the ukulele is a strumming, chord strumming instrument because it's taking advantage of that shift so you can quickly play chords. Um, now, that shift does not show up in all instruments. It, the ukulele and the guitar are unique in that way for having the shift. Um, but the bass and the double bass, because they just focus on these bottom four strings where there's not that shift, it's just a perfect cascading vertical line of fourths and fifths. Um, it lends itself, th these instruments lend themselves more to melodic 
or sequential note patterns rather than simultaneous note patterns, also known as chords. Uh, so we're looking at these tuning summaries again. And uh, what we have here is again, just to, to recap where we're at this point, guitar, bass guitar and double bass uh, match these bottom four strings. And then the ukulele matches the same tuning sequence in that there's this major third right there, but it's shifted up to the fifth fret because of a fourth. So instead of having this be a G string, this is a C string, which is its perfect fourth. And likewise, D, its perfect fourth is G, B's perfect fourth is E, and E's perfect fourth is A. So it's just the guitar pattern starting on the fifth fret and with the top two strings. Now these other instruments, this is where it gets really cool. So, I mean, it's already really cool, but this is where it gets even cooler. So the ma <clears throat> mandolin is, if we were to put in a mirror, right? This dotted line is like a reflection. We have the mandolin is a reflection of the bass guitar. So instead of having the notes fall in a uh, sequence of fifths, now they're uh, falling in a sequence of fourths. E's perfect fourth is A, A's perfect fourth is D, and D's perfect fourth is G. So going down, so it's just the reverse, in other words. So, uh, and the same is true for the violin. The violin, uh, so the bass and the double bass are the same. And the mandolin and the violin are the same. They're just both mirror images of the bass and the double bass. So in other words, if you know how to play the bass guitar, because you already know how to play the guitar, the six string guitar, then you, just flipping it, it's a mirror image in your head and therefore your fingers, you're then, you know how to play the mandolin and the violin because you don't have to relearn everything because all of the strings still follow a chromatic scale pattern. Every string as it rises up is a chromatic scale pattern. We're just talking about the tuning and the tuning is just the mirror image. And then likewise, just how, just like how the ukulele is up a fourth. So instead of D, we play G. Instead of G, we play C and so on. The viola is up a fourth from the mandolin and violin. And so is the cello. These are octaves apart. So the cello, just like the bass guitar is the same as the four, bottom four strings of the guitar, but down an octave. The cello is down an octave from the viola but both the cello and the viola are up a fourth from the violin in terms of tuning, but then octave wise, it's down, if that makes sense. So we're, we're talking about reflections, we're talking about octaves, and we're talking about subsets of patterns, but all of these are derived from the guitar. Like if you know the guitar pattern, now we're just talking about a subset, let's just chop off some of the strings, whether it's down, to play bass and double bass, or it's up to play ukulele, or it's a mirror image to play the mandolin and the violin, or uh, just up uh, some finger positions to play viola and cello, but down an octave. So it's just up and down. We're just talking about patterns. Like that's the beauty of music is just patterns. Um, so looking at the mandolin just on its own, now that we understand what the tuning is, which again, is just a mirror image of the bass and the double bass, once you know that, then the same principles of the chromatic scale rising up each string are the same. Uh, but the cool thing is, is just like on the guitar, it's this intersection, this interlaced matrix of the circle of fifths and the chromatic scale uh, for the mandolin. Likewise, if you play the violin, it's the same. It's it's the same. <laughs> it's, it's not anything more than that. It's the same. And then the viola is uh, tuned. I guess you could say it's down, down a fourth um, because it's an octave uh, lower. The viola is a little bit lower than the violin. And then the cello is even lower than the viola, but it's the same tuning. So uh, that is uh, 
what these patterns look like. So if we, we were to summarize this and show, um, show these again as subsets and reflections, we're starting with the guitar. Guitar is our frame of reference. It's this big rectangle right here. And the bass and the double bass are a subset of that on the bottom four strings. The ukulele is a subset of the guitar on the top four strings shift up, shifted up a fourth. And then the reflection image, the mandolin and the uh, violin are a reflection of the bass and the double bass. And then the viola and the cello are shifted up a fourth. Uh, and in the case of the cello, it's an octave below the viola. So this one image, and all of these images are going to, all these diagrams are going to be in the library. I'll add them to a post where you can soak them in at your own pace. But this is, in essence, what the uh, the different instrument patterns are. They're just uh, sub patterns of, of sub patterns. Another way to look at it, like I know it's kind of abstract sometimes to look at just the the matrices or the fretboard patterns, but since we recognize these instruments as their, their bodies. Um, this is a, a summary of what that is, is we have the guitars, our starting point, and then the bass and the double bass are uh, a subset of the guitar. The ukulele is a subset shifted up a fourth. And then the reflection, this is the, the dotted line, the mirror image, the reflection of those two subset patterns are the ukulele or the uh, mandolin and the violin. And then shifted up a fourth is the viola and the cello. So how those eight instruments are laid out. It's one, you can walk into a music instrument store and like, whoa, all of these different instruments. But once you understand from a music theory perspective, they are one and the same. It becomes less overwhelming to the point that, you know, you know, you could, you could have a synthesizer and just, you know, play, you know, get a, a pad that makes, you know, I can play, you know, a piano here. Or if I add a strings uh, sound effect, it sounds like I can play the violin. And, and I can make it kind of sound like a violin with a keyboard. Or you can actually pick up a violin and, and play it. Now, there are the inherent, you know, there's the nuance and the technique of playing it, you know, the way that you were to play a violin, you know, with a bow and the way that your fingers are, are positioned on the instrument it takes practice, right? Cause it's, it's not just pure theory the, it, you have to interact with the, the physicality of it, but knowing the pattern is, I would say at least half the battle, if not much more than 50% of the battle, knowing how the notes are laid out. And uh, I remember the first instrument that I learned how to play when I was like 10 was, was the violin. And it was through music notation. I was exposed to the patterns of music using music notation, uniform black dots on staff lines. It was super confusing, super frustrating. But once you can actually see the patterns on these instruments, uh, you uh, can, can jump right in. I, uh, I've had some questions about, you know, are there instrument labels for all of these instruments? And um, right now um, I do have instrument labels for guitar and uh, guitar, whether it's acoustic and electric or classical nylon string. So there are fretboard labels for that also for uh, ukulele and for keyboard, though that's not what we're talking about here. I've had a lot of questions about, are there labels for uh, bass guitar, which I'm actively looking at right now. So that is uh, something that is in the works for bass guitar labels. Um, also um, working on uniform, or sorry, universal labels. So you can apply them to any instrument and uh, you know, whether it's the, the mandolin, the violin, uh, the xylophone, the glockenspiel, whatever it might be. I'm gonna have more information on that as that gets further along and there's, uh, there's more to talk about there. Uh, but that is uh, something to, to be looking for because it's going to open up your, your world, my world, our world as musicians to be able to play all these, uh, play all these instruments. There was actually a great, I have to uh, give a shout out to Springer One in the library uh, just a couple of days ago. Springer One said, you know, they're using the fretboard labels and it was such a nice way to put it. They said, 
it's like having, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like having eyes on my fingertips <laughs> to be able to see the patterns, which is, is kind of a surreal and cool way to phrase it. And I love that. Um, so thank you, Springer One, for saying that in such a, a beautifully poetic way. Uh, and the same will uh, apply to the other instruments with the bass labels and the universal labels uh, once those are available. Um, let me see if I have this summary um, of patterns. Yeah. So like I say, this is this diagram is going to be in the library. I'll add it. Um, and then also all of the different instrument diagrams um, for these eight stringed instruments. Like I say, these are Western based on Western chromatic scale, Western tuning. Um, so not talking about the sitar per se, as an example uh, that George Harrison played, but all of the others and all of the wind instruments and uh, keyboard instruments. Some of them are percussive, like the xylophone and all of that. But once you see that they're all just the same thing, then it's not overwhelming and in fact, exciting to be able to jump in and play. Uh, so I'm going to jump into the comments here to see uh, if I can speak to any questions that have come up. Just kind of scrolling through. Let me... Very cool. It's uh, I love nerding out about music with you all. Uh, uh, Rusty, you said, I know I'm kind of catching up here, but you said, I need to study more theory. Um, it, with the, with these patterns, I know I'm talking at a high level in terms of, you know, I'm talking about the chromatic scale and the circle of fists, and they form this matrix of notes on the fretboard and fingerboards and all of that. And speaking a little bit fast, I could slow down a little bit, but I do uh, get into the details of how those patterns are formed in the first place, where the circle of fifths comes from and its relation to the chromatic scale. Basically, the circle of fifths and the chromatic scale are just rearrangements of one another, uh, which you can see with, with the colors here and the shapes. Um, and then in the last, I think it was the last live stream or the one before, anyway, a recent live stream talked about why use colors and shapes, how they are a more intuitive interface to understanding theory. So um, yeah, once you see that music is patterns and once you understand how those patterns work, it all makes much more sense. Um, uh, very cool. Uh, let's see. I am jumping into uh, this comment here. So, Laura, you said, hello, I'm thinking of picking up acoustic electric guitar and already know sheet music since I play piano. Should I take tabs or sheet music approach? So I do have, a, and thank you for your question. So I do have a, a recent live stream that talks about uh, tablature. And I, I'm, I don't mince a whole lot of words on it. I'm not a fan of tablature. Uh, the reason being in a nutshell is that it doesn't really show how patterns work on the instrument. Um, it's just telling you where to place your fingers. And so I should, I should preface that with, it depends on what your goals are. So everything I talk about here through the lens of music theory is for the ultimate goal of songwriting um, because to really become fluid and fluent in the language of music, um, understanding music theory is like understanding a language, like knowing if you want to tell a story in a given language, knowing the language is very helpful to articulate and express yourself in that language. So music theory is, is, uh, is key, pardon the pun, to songwriting. Um, so a lot of times, and this was the case with me with like both tablature and music notation or sheet music when I first got into it is that they were framed, they meaning tab and music notation were framed as a way to understand music theory when in fact they're not really, um, <clears throat> or they're not well suited to illustrating theory. They obscure it. So in, in, um, in the library, uh, I have a music theory course where I get into detail about music notation and how it uh, can trip you up. It can be more confusing than clarifying in terms of understanding theory. Uh, and so I would say study theory and not music notation, which can seem like a contradiction in terms because people conflate the two and confuse 
notation with theory when they are in fact two separate things. So, um, uh, so if your goal is for is songwriting, then I would say uh, uh, learn the patterns of music first, um, meaning like scales and how scales inform or lead to the construction of chords and how chords lead to the construction of progressions and so on. Uh, and if you haven't checked out the course, it starts at square one, assuming you have no background in theory at all. Um, and it builds up and each concept builds on the next. Uh, that's what I would recommend. And there's lots of resources in the library that, that get into all sorts of theory. Um, electric and acoustic guitar, I think is awesome. It's such, it's like such a beautiful instrument. Um, I talk about the Beatles a lot, but if, if you know uh, the story of Paul McCartney, he first started on the trumpet. Trumpet's an amazing instrument. His dad gave him a trumpet when he was a teenager. And he said it took him about two weeks to learn that he couldn't sing with a trumpet in his gob, <laughs> I think is the way he phrased it. And so he asked his dad, hey, is it all right if I trade this in for a guitar? And his dad was like, that's fine. And so he picked up a guitar and the rest is history. The guitar is awesome for songwriting, if that's your goal. Um, all right, that was a long answer to a short question. Hopefully that helps though. Um, all right, Jack, you said muscle memory would probably have to catch up to the theory knowledge when going between instruments. Yes, that's a good point is, you know, uh, once you see the pattern in your mind's eye and with your eyes, physical eyes, um, literal eyes, that is, uh, it's much easier to then uh, tackle the muscle memory because your muscles have somewhere to go. Your, your muscles have something to memorize or something to remember um, based on the theory. But yeah, that's a good point is that uh, the, the physical, technical nature of playing these instruments does take practice. It's more than just an immediate uh, thing. So I love that point. Um, Rusty, you said, uh, I would like, uh, I would think so between bowed and str uh, strummed instruments, I think in response to Jack, probably. Um, yes. And uh, is it true? I have it in my head. I was actually listening to, speaking of just bowed and strummed instruments, that Led Zeppelin's Cashmere, I'm pretty sure that he's playing the electric guitar with a bow. Is that true? Because then I was listening to the song, even just this last week, I was telling someone about that and I was like, yeah, he's He's playing the electric guitar with a violin bow, but then I can't totally tell if that's the case or if I just like imagined that. If anyone in the chat knows, I'd love to find out. Um, but that's kind of uh, an unusual blending of instruments to play uh, an electric guitar with a violin bow. Um, let's see. Uh... Okay, so I like this question, Sana. You said, in which category uh, is the banjo played? Uh, okay, so in India and Pakistan. So uh, it's a banjo. Maybe I'm. So this may be an instrument that I'm not sure of. I know of the banjo, which may not be what you're referring to. So the banjo, if that's a different instrument, I'll need to look at the tuning to see where that might be categorized or where that falls. Um, I actually have, uh, have not posted it in the library yet, but it's this summary of like virtually all instruments uh, and how they're categorized into, you know, the main families of instruments, wind, string, uh, percussion, and what is it like electric, electronic or something. Um, so I'll be posting that and the banjo may show up on that. It's been a minute since I've looked at it. Um, hey, cool. Jack, you said, I just got my labels last week. I love them. Love to hear it. Very cool. And uh, I, I uh, hope you're enjoying them and uh, checking out all the stuff in the library where there's a lot to uh, put theory to practice. And speaking of, I'm working on lesson 13, making great progress on that, uh, which is the, uh, the art of songwriting uh, is the, the lesson title. And there's a lot of putting theory to practice in this next lesson. Um, all right. So... Let's see. So Rodney, you said color music patterns should facilitate playing in tune on a fretless instrument like the violin, but bowing requires a formidable technique. Yeah, bowing definitely is. I mean, having played the violin, I, I was no 
virtuoso by any means. I, I was 10, but um, it, it was definitely kind of crazy to play with the bow. And um, yes, the, the color music patterns do facilitate uh, playing in tune and on a fretless instrument um, uh, because the frets aren't, aren't a key factor. Um, but yeah, the, the technique technique is its own animal as it were. Um, Hey, Alapico, cool to see you on. And, um, all right. So, uh, Tulagorum, Tulagorum, if I'm saying that correctly. So I'd prefer working from diagrams rather than labels directly on the fretboard. I'd rather work till the diagram is in my head and under my fingers rather than rely on a visual prop on the instrument. Um, I can see that, um, you know, ultimately having it in your mind's eye is the goal. Um, and, uh, you know, once you can see these patterns, you can't really unsee them. So, you know, people will ask me, you know, whether it's a guitar or a keyboard or whatever, you know, am I be going to become reliant on these labels? Like, will I be in essence musically blind without them? Um, and the answer is no, at least that's the case for me. You know, I can, I can play another, like if I don't have the labels on an instrument, I can play it because the theory is like baked into my mind now. And the theory is that's, that's what informs the instrument. So, uh, yeah, I think I, I, it's wise to not want to lean on a crutch. I think, um, being cognizant of that is, is really good, um, it's never become a crutch for me and for, for others. So, um, yeah, it, however, whatever works for you to get those patterns in, in your mind, uh, is good. Uh, let's see. Okay, cool. So Jack, you said, I think he was using a bow. So if you're talking about the Led Zeppelin song, so that's good to know. Cause I, I swear, I'm like, I swear I like, knew that at one point and then i didn't know it after listening to the song i couldn't totally tell um but what a cool innovative way to uh use the guitar um let's see uh elgato 90 you said i recently learned there is this stringed instrument from albania that is like a banjo but only has two strings have you heard of it it's quite impressive how they make music with just two strings so i'm not familiar with it or if, if um if I heard the name, I might recognize it. Yeah, there's some interesting um, instruments like traditional instruments in China that have maybe two strings or uh, one string is probably pushing it. Um, here, let's see. I have a link here. Is it the Sift Teli, the Albanian instrument? Yeah, it's doubled or double stringed. It's plucked stringed instrument with only two strings. Uh, thank you for this link. Uh, played mainly by the Albanians of northern and central Albania, southern Montenegro, and parts of North Macedonia and Kosovo. That's crazy. Um, I'm looking at an image here, and uh, I don't know if I can... I, I'll figure out the tech to be able to show that more immediately. Um, but yes, so I think that's what we're referring to. And um, I'd need to look at the tuning to see... Do you know how the strings are tuned? Um, I wonder if it's a major third like the ukulele, um, you know, and the guitar the, to facilitate chord playing. Maybe not, but that would be cool if it was. Um, okay, so, oh, there you go. Elgato 90, you said. So it's the Sift Telly, okay, is the name. So that is, um, and I might be pronouncing it incorrectly too. Uh, I'm interested to check that out. I'm not familiar with it, nor have I seen one until now. Uh, but it's cool how you, to your point, it's amazing how people can make music with such a limited thing. That reminds me of, it's kind of, kind of tangential, but, um, Jack White of the White Stripes, uh, you know, he was, uh, what's the word? He was an upholsterer, if that's a, a profession name. So he worked on upholstery before the White Stripes took off. And he said he was working on, to the point of simplicity like two strings leading to amazing things. He was working on like the tax. He was applying the upholstery on like an armchair and he was pressing the tax into the back of it. And there were only three tax and the economy of that and the efficiency and how simple it was 
to, he's like, all I needed was three tacks. And he's like, in that moment, it was like an epiphany. It actually gives me chills. Um, he's like, it was an epiphany because he's like, all you need is like three things to have, you know, something work. And so that informs, like, if you hear White Stripes songs, like they're so simple um, in terms of like their, their structure, because he's like, and that's how he like, he's prolific in his output. Cause he's like, you only need a limited number of things. Taking that further <laughs> with the Albanian instrument, two strings is like, wow, you can do some amazing things. That's cool. Um, let's see. Um, okay. So, um, Rusty, have you written songs to a drum beat? Yes. And actually that's, uh, in uh, lesson 13 of the course that I'm working on right now, the art of songwriting, I talk about different, there are many roads that lead to Rome, as the saying goes, that you can start at different points. So a lot of times you can start with a chord progression. So the harmony, and then add, you know, lyrics, melody, and, you know, flesh out the rhythm from there. Or you might start with the rhythm or drum beat. And like, you know, you might hear your you know, washer and dryer making this cool pattern. And then you're like, oh, okay. It kind of leads itself to some lyrics that lend themselves to melody and chords and so on. So you can start with different layers and arrive at really cool, really cool songs. Um, but all that to say, yes. Uh, and is that how you prefer uh, to write songs is starting with the rhythm? Is that um, your preferred method? It's always interesting to hear how people go about things. The Chinese Eru um, is, wow. That Does that have one string? Oh, it's two strings. Okay. So two strings. Albania and China are getting super efficient <laughs> with the strings. That's awesome. So, okay. Um, uh, let me get to... Alapico, you said the patterns seen via the label become felt as muscle memory is trained. That is a very succinct, beautiful way to put it. Yes. Uh, and uh, yeah, as Confucius said, uh, and I think I'm paraphrasing, or maybe this is just the, the quote is, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. Um, and so each is progressively, you know, more and more. And, and that's especially true for uh, visual learners and for uh, tactile learners. You know, each one uh, builds on the rest. I love that summary. That's beautiful. Um, P. Cash, you said, I started learning a uke a few years ago as my first instrument. Then I bought a keyboard to help me understand theory better. The linearity of the keyboard helped me understand chords easier. I can definitely see that. Um, and it's, I have a, a post on TikTok that <laughs> talks about the progress. I come back to the Beatles a lot, but the progression of the Beatles, and it's almost like, and I think some guitar players uh, were mad about this, but I was saying, like, if you look at their evolution, they like kind of go from guitar to keyboard. Um, is that because it's more conducive to songwriting? Not necessarily. It might have been also the the style at the time, but um, the keyboard does being linear to your point definitely does simplify things because the guitar is basically six keyboards stacked on top of each other with that tuning between strings, which can add uh, visual and conceptual complexity, uh, but then also makes it you know easy to move between notes really quickly too. So there's drawbacks and benefits, but yeah, I think, um, going to the keyboard can definitely help solidify concepts. Okay. So I jumped ahead because I hadn't gotten to your uh, comment here. The Chinese Eru is a one string violin. It's pretty amazing uh, what they can do with it. Yeah. So I saw one, there was a link that I saw that had two strings. And then I, I think I've seen one with one string as well. It reminds me of, if you've seen the movie alive, um, with Ethan Hawke and others. It's about, uh, I think they're, it's a soccer team that like crashed in the Andes and had to survive through the winter and even turn to cannibalism to survive. Anyway, there's one scene where, because the plane crash basically ruined everything and even killed people, there was like one string remaining on the guitar. And so to pass his time, one of the guys was playing one string and 
and one of the the uh, people in the movie was like, "Hey, how about you play Flight of the Bumblebee?" Just as a joke, because like, how would you do that on one string? But apparently, you can do amazing things. Um, I'm learning about all cool instruments here. So the Mongolian two string bowed instrument is interesting, played by Batsorig Vanching. Okay, so I'm going to be taking notes after this. Three instruments have been added to my radar. And of course, um, you said you've got Justin Johnson and his three thing, three string shovel guitar. That's awesome. So, uh, so much variety in instruments. Oh, okay. So, um, you said the sift, sift, uh, telly is often tuned to B3 and E4, if that says anything. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, they're a fourth or a fifth apart, depending on which one is the low string, uh, which would lend itself to, uh, to chords and nice harmonies. So that's cool. And that's one thing too, about the, um, the different instruments that we looked at here. Like you have the fingerboard instruments, like a, a violin, a viola and a cello and a double bass because of the fingerboard being arched. Uh, you can really kind of, in, in the way that you bow, you can really kind of just hit two strings at a time. So unlike on a guitar and a ukulele where the strings are, you know, strong, you know, they're across the, the fretboard at, at a uniform height, which allows you to strum them and play chords. So it's partly the tuning, like on the guitar and the ukulele, that's conducive to chord playing, but then also just the physical structure of the instrument allowing for uh, playing multiple strings, more than just two at a time. Um, okay, so it does have two strings, but yeah, that's still amazing though on the uh, Eru, if I'm saying that, er, er, Erhu, um, amazing, uh, super cool. And it's funny how they didn't just add more strings. Like while, while you're at it, <laughs> it seems like you might as well just make the fretboard a little larger and, and uh, make it that much versatile in the notes that you can play, but there's something beautiful, kind of like the, the Jack White philosophy of simplicity to like almost force constraint uh, to get creative. Um, that's something that's really cool. I think about like uh, William Shakespeare is with iambic pentameter, the fact that he or whoever the group was that might be credited with writing all those plays, the fact that they had that constraint of having to have verses flow in iambic pentameter makes it even that much more amazing. So there's something to be said for forced constraint. Um, so Rusty, I love playing with words, but just a beginner guitar player. I've been uh, reading Sheila Davis, a book on songwriting while listening to drum tracks on the keyboard. That's cool. Um, and uh, I think rhythm, just even just marinating your mind in rhythm is really, really good really good for songwriting uh, to soak in those patterns and just be thinking in patterns because rhythm being patterns of time. I mean, music is the audible convergence of space and time, time being rhythm, space being the intervals and relationships between pitch, whether those are melodic intervals or harmonic chord intervals. So it's all about patterns. And so uh, I think that's, that's excellent. Um, Okay, so this is a good point. And this is actually really interesting because like I say, I'm working on Lesson 13 that talks about the art of songwriting and different approaches and the order of operations in composition. So Jackie said, I like starting with rhythm first in a song and writing as well. Uh, that's really cool. And I think that can make for some especially good songs uh, because rhythm imbuing all of the layers of music, harmony, melody, lyrics, all of it with rhythm and having that be a driving force uh, I think makes for uh, good music. I'm looking at a link of the shovel guitar. <laughs> That's awesome. It's literally a shovel. So that is like economy on the next level. That's brilliant. Because basically the shovel, I'll figure it out how to be able to show this more easily on uh, on my screen. But um, that's awesome. I've seen uh, cigar box uh, guitars but never a shovel guitar. I love it because basically the, basically it's just the shovel. The body of the, the shovel is the body of the uh, guitar. And then 
using that metal to like bolt in like a bridge. And then the headstock of the shovel is where you can have the tuning pegs and then the body or the, the, the handle of the shovel becomes the fretboard. That's awesome. Uh, let's see. Okay. So this is good for people to know since we're talking about this instrument. So the C in Siftelli is pronounced ch as in church. So chift telly. Okay, cool. I love geeking out about this stuff with, with everyone here is <laughs> like, how cool is that? Like learning multiple new instruments and how to pronounce them and their tuning. Um, okay. So would you consider making a circle of fifths app as a teaching aid? This is a good question. And one that I get, uh, so thank you Colton for asking it. So there's this circle of fifths that I use in videos that is, you know, interactive, uh, and multi-layered so you can, you know, explore different chord patterns, different modes and different keys. Um, and so, uh, the uh, circle of fifths app is something that I have actually done quite a bit of work on and something that I'm definitely looking at, uh, continuing on and, and, uh, getting out there. Um, uh, in the immediate short term, um, this has been my go-to of choice partly, well, there are a couple of reasons. So I just want to talk through some of those. So, um, so right now, the thing I'm really loving on this, uh, version of the circle of fifths is that it's tactile for one. So it's, it's like, there's almost something about looking at something on a screen that feels like, like inaccessible. Like it's still, it's behind the screen. Like I can't get my hands on it. So having it be, having the circle of fist diagram be tangible and tactile like this just like solidifies concepts in a way uh, that is really helpful. And then also being uh, not being offline in the sense that, you know, I don't have to be looking at the screen. So if I'm playing, you know, as I'm relaxing at night and, you know, I could get blue blocker glasses and, and not wake myself up looking at a screen as much, but having it be offline, you know, is there's this organic, uh, beauty to it that, uh, I, I really love and also, uh, making it, uh, so that it's an app. Like I say, I've, a lot of work has been done on an app that will facilitate songwriting. Um, and, and there's going to be a benefit to that. A benefit to this is that there isn't the potential of getting distracted uh, or disconnected from the songwriting process if I get a message that pops up or if I start scrolling, uh, you know, social media and I'm like, damn, I had that song idea, but it, you know, so having it uh, pull me away from potential distractions is great. Um, so it's kind of like the difference, I guess, uh, as a comparison between, you know, garage band versus playing an instrument. It's just a different experience, digital versus organic. Um, and so, uh, you know, we don't need more reasons to be on electronics, especially when, you know, we're connecting with life and life uh, music being this existential connection with life. Uh, you know, there's, there's something to, to this. Um, that said, working on it. <laughs> <laughs> after all that. So, um, uh, uh, and as we go, if there are any, any thoughts on, you know, features that would be helpful, uh, let me know. Uh, it's definitely a process. It's, it's a, there's a lot of cool stuff to it. Um, okay. So, uh, to Legorum, you said app would be cool compared to a physical wheel. You could configure the level of detail to show for different uses. Yeah, and some of these um, diagrams that I'm going to be talking about in some upcoming videos about uh, using the circle of fifths, like uh, further insight into informing substitute chords, borrowed chords, uh, chord relationships that uh, lend themselves well to really cool chord progressions, all of that. There are uh, different level of levels of detail uh, that are helpful that inform uh, your movement through harmonic space. Um, okay. So, 
Uh, Russ, you said, I just uh, I have found that just because something reads well doesn't mean it will sound good when sung. Understanding how the human voice works is important in songwriting. Yeah. Uh, and that's one thing, too. Being able, knowing theory, just speaking of how the human voice works and just the, I would say constraint, but really it's more the limitation or the vocal range. Oh, that's another diagram that I'll be posting in the library about different pitch ranges of instruments and how they relate uh, within a, a whole sonic palette uh, in terms of songwriting. There are different ranges like vocal range, you know, being able to modulate a song and shift keys uh, to accommodate a certain singer's vocal range on the fly is made possible through understanding music theory and knowing, oh, okay, these, these patterns are cyclical and symmetrical from one key to the next. So, you know, I, I might like to play this song in the key of E because it's comfortable for my uh, voice box. But if I'm playing with another singer who is maybe up a third or up a fourth or up a fifth, like knowing one, what those numbers mean and how to project them into audible reality uh, is all based on music theory. Um, so yeah, it's uh, a lot of factors at play, but once you understand how they all fit together as different elements within the whole songwriting uh canvas, you know, painting, painting, uh, pictures with sound and knowing the technique behind it, uh, is a beautiful thing. Um, let's see on the shovel guitar. I saw a great video earlier today, which experimented with what, uh, impacts the sound on electric guitar. It was almost all the pickups and bridge on electric. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it's, it's cool to think it's like amazing to think. I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, it's established that Les Paul, you know, invented the guitar, or at least was maybe the one who, or for sure is the one who helped popularize it. Um, but it's crazy to think that the electric guitar was not a thing. And even not even that long ago, uh, to have such a recent advent totally change the face of music is amazing. Uh, and with these diagrams, I didn't show them in the diagrams, uh, in this stream, but the, uh, the different instrument, uh, diagram showing how the tuning informs the playing. Um, I have little factoids on the different instruments. So like when it was invented or when it first was released. Uh, and it's kind of cool to see like the history of some of these instruments, how old they are, where they came from, what genres they're typically used in and all of that. It's, we're, uh, we're sitting, we're standing on the shoulders of giants in terms of all of the innovations. I mean, how cool is it that we can just go figure out and play all these different instruments? Like they've all been invented, uh, at least to date, the ones that we're looking at here uh, to be able to play them is awesome. Um, Russ, you said, so do you believe in tone wood on solid body electric guitars? That's a good question. I know there are passionate thoughts on that. Um, and I, I, I understand where people are coming from in terms of their love of it, um, but I don't have a super strong stance on it. Um, much of my geeking out focuses on the, the tuning itself and how, how it's played. Um, but there's amazing, amazing uh, exploration in, in acoustics and all that good stuff. Um, so we're a little bit over an hour. I, just trying to shoot for an hour on this one. So I think I'll be wrapping this one up. Um, thank you for joining and for all these comments. Uh, like I say, to geek out with you all on music and music theory is so fun. And I'll be adding these diagrams to the library so that you can uh, take them in at your own pace and more to come. Thanks for joining. And we will be talking very soon. I'll see you.